Welcome to the Seniors Flourish Podcast, where it's all about helping occupational therapy practitioners disrupt the norm by throwing away the rainbow art and being the best you can be when working with older adults. You know when you have those patients that don't want to put up handrails on the stairs or outside the house because they're afraid it'll make the house look ugly or make the patient look, quote, old? Well, I found these handrails from Promenade that are super stylish, come in all sorts of finishes and colors to match any type of house. I like that they're super adjustable and you can literally put them anywhere. Even those funky corners where the patient needs something but nothing ever quite fits. They ship quick and be installed right away so we can adapt the home to what our patient needs fast, which is our number one priority. Check them out at promenade.com, P-R-O-M-E-N-A-I-D.com. Welcome everyone to the Seniors Flourish podcast and the Speaking of OT between us ode. I'm Mandy Chamberlain. And I'm Sarah Stromsdorfer, and we're (sighs) occupational therapists And today, we're talking about AOTA's recent article, Five Things Patients and Providers Should Question. That was a good one. I really, I I can't wait to dig into this one. (laughs) I know, me too. I'm really excited. But first, Mandy, I have to um, ask you, where are you recording today's (laughs) podcast episode? This is actually super hilarious. And I think it's funny that you even bring it up because maybe... People have heard, I've randomly talked about this in on Instagram and some other previous episodes, but I live in like the mountain part. I always say like the mountainous part, the resort area of Colorado. And so, so you have Denver and then you literally have like the rest of the state. So it's mountainous and beautiful and ski country, but we have terrible terrible internet. <laughs> and so yeah, okay. as somebody, okay. yeah, it's like, it's, it's, it's really dumb. <laughs> and as somebody who does a podcast and has a website and does my membership site, like that's not like a good combination, like crappy internet and <laughs> an internet business. <laughs> like it's serious. <laughs> I know it's, it's not great, but so um, I'm in the process of buying an office and um, I'm getting in there in a couple of weeks. So I'm like, I, I seriously, when my husband said he was like today, today, he was like, I think we're going to close on your office early. I was like crying with joy. Oh. <laughs> I was just like, I get me in my office, which means I can get high speed internet, I guess is what I'm saying. So I'm just like, it this is, is so, so crucial. It's so crucial. Okay. Well, so long story short, I am at the library (laughs) recording this episode. It's, and it's ridiculous because like we have this beautiful library and it's like super modern and they have all these like, they're not like podcasting rooms. They're just like study rooms and it's all glass. So I'm like, have this set up and like anybody who walks past me and like the people in the rooms next to me, it's just like the weirdest, <laughs> weirdest thing, but you do what you got to do. <laughs> and so, yeah, I'm at and the you library. And um, you mentioned you have a blanket to like muffle sound. How do you have your blanket <laughs> set up? Are you like hiding in a blanket or? <laughs> I could be. So if you, if you do, if you do any recording, they always say like, a closet is a perfect place to record a podcast. So I brought this little blanket. It's my kid's blanket from like the airplane. They, you know, like those kind of like a little fleece. Yeah, fleece. And I have it like a little on a little cocoon around my microphone. (laughs) I almost, I'm going to take a picture of myself. Like this is ridiculous. (laughs) But you. That sounds amazing. But, but you're like, you're recording what are you doing? You tell everyone that you're doing. So, this is funny too. So let, me, let me tell you guys. Um, I have been doing Airbnb for four years. I live in a very, very small little shoebox condo in Atlanta. It's two bedrooms. And um, so it's about 7 p.m. But um, our guest is here and I believe he may be napping <laughs> about 20, 25 feet away. So I'm talking just like really close to the microphone. So he doesn't hear, but I'm like, well, 7 p.m. So I guess this is okay. But um, we are going to be done with Airbnb (laughs) in approximately six weeks because we are, my husband and I are getting a trailer, travel trailer, and we are going to do um, a little travel therapy road trip um, instead of doing traditional travel therapy, doing um, just traveling on the road in the trailer, working on the My OT Spot blog. So we will not have to worry about napping people. And. That's amazing. And what else is fun is Sarah is coming to Colorado and we're going to meet up. So we're going to do, I think, a live 
or an episode together. I think that'll be fun. I'm so excited. I think we're going to try to get our husbands on together and they both don't seem um, as excited as we are, but we're going to try to do it and we're going to park our trailer in Mandy's driveway. (laughs) (laughs) It'll be fun. It'll be like an outlet. It'll be great. It will be fun. Yeah. So we'll keep everyone posted on um, Sarah's travel adventure slash parking in my driveway so we can do an episode. (laughs) (laughs) Hopefully we will be able to use your office. Yeah. Well, yeah. See, you can't have, there's no, there's terrible internet at my house. So you'll have to come to the office. It'll be fine. It'll, it'll feel really like official and important. (laughs) Okay. So back to the AOTA article about their choosing wisely campaign and their article, the five things patients and providers should question. Yeah. Yeah. So there's five things that it was really interesting because they have it. Yeah. Through choose, choosing wisely. So they're talking about these are things that if you are receiving occupational therapy services, essentially, and your occupational therapist is doing any of these five things that you should question it, right? Like talking Mm -hmm. about like evidence-based, um, evidence-based, you know, uh, practice. Yeah. Yeah. Practice and that kind of thing. So like, what's the first one? Treatment. So the first one is our, both our favorites. It's don't provide intervention activities that are non-purposeful. For example, cones, pegs, shoulder arc, and arm bike. Oh, you know, I have a hate, a hate for the, for the rainbow arc relationship. I hate, hate relationship with the rainbow arc. Like it's just one of those things. I just feel it's so kind of dumb. And, you know, there are just so many, so many other real occupations that can provide the same range of motion, like we've talked about so many times. And yeah, and old and other episodes. But I seriously have a passion for helping people like be more occupation based. And like it sounds so obvious, but it's actually really hard. And then you have people like coworkers that are kind of not really into it. And then you just feel like, well, should I be doing it this way? Because this is what the crowd is doing. And it's just one of those things. Like I just feel like it's it's actually more it's harder than people It's hard when you have the productivity demands, yes. especially in yes skilled nursing facilities, because you do see it's easier to do an arm bike to do your notes, but um, just to kind of drive it home on this number one um, aspect of the article, it's purposeful activities build on the person's ability and lead to achievement of personal and functional goals. And conversely, the non-purposeful activities do not stimulate interest or motivation, resulting in reduced patient participation mm-hmm. and suboptimal outcomes. So that can just kind of prove that it's just not great to be doing the arm bike, even though it can be easier in certain settings. You can find other really good occupation-based treatments that can hopefully still. Yeah, yeah. Get, the, get accomp- yeah, and accomplish the goals. I mean, like, there's always a time and a place for some sort of, you know, purposeful activity or a preparatory activity. Like, sometimes it just needs to be done, but it ultimately has to link to the core of occupational therapy and being occupation based and achieving the patient's goals for being occupational beings. But, and the research supports it. So, yes, thank you, AOTA number one. Get rid yes, of those so non, non-purposeful <laughs> activities. Okay. Number two. Where are we? Don't provide. Number two. Yeah. Up. Yeah. No, it's like don't provide sensory-based interventions to individual children or youth without documented assessment results of difficulties, proce- difficulties processing or integrating sensory information. Hmm. Interesting. So this one is tough for us to talk about as much since we're older adults, but it does make a lot of sense to be using the evidence. Um, like, so it says, with, don't use it without documented assessment results and the interventions that do not target the documented pattern. So basically documenting the reason why you're doing these sensory interve- interventions. Yeah, just don't do them to do them. And I feel like it kind of it does kind of apply to lots of other interventions. Like you have to document that they're having an issue in that just because they're a kid and they have um, said diagnosis, right? Like doesn't mean that they need that sensory um, sensory based intervention. So like it's just like when we do any assessment and 
we or an evaluation, like we have to provide the interventions that correlate with the intervent or uh, evaluation with results and assessment and, results. Yeah. yeah. So again, makes complete sense. But I think I can see how that can happen, right? Like you just. Right. Because you're like, everybody needs some sort of sensory. I mean, I that's such a loose, similar. that's a blank, that's a blanket statement. But you know what I'm kind of saying? I feel like, what were you saying, Sarah? I feel like it, I feel like it's similar to the arm bike for older adults. Like it might be just something that you just do because you see people doing it, but you just need the reason yeah. to back it up. Yeah. And you have to have like a, a plan of care and a reason and a goal. Like how, how is that in, impacting their occupational performance? And so, yeah, exactly. Along this, along the same lines, I'd say. Yeah. Okay, number three. Number three, don't use physical agent modalities without providing purposeful and occupation-based intervention activities. Dun dun dun! This is a big one. Do you see that? Happening? Yeah, do you see this? Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, do you see this? Much? So, my state, Georgia, is interesting. So, we have to get a physical agent modality certification, which is mm-hmm. like five hundred dollars, and it's a weekend course. So, a lot of therapists, um, we actually don't have the certification in acute care and inpatient rehab. So, con- so we also just don't have a lot of modalities in inpatient rehab. So, I'm curious to see in Colorado, do you see this happening? Interesting. A lot? Not even inpatient rehab, huh? That's yeah, so a couple yeah. of the therapists, um, they use eSTEM, yeah. but a lot of us don't have don't. a certification. Yeah. Well, in Colorado, um, you don't have to have a PAM certification. Most facilities show our, um, you have to show competence, um, you know, like you have to go through a thing saying like, oh, yes, I know how to use it. This is how you use the machine. Like it, it's a lot of it's like um, facility policy. Um, mm-hmm. And um, I just... I'm actually surprised inpatient rehab. I I just kind of see like, yeah, we use them, I would say often as like, you know, I would say like Russian for ESTEM for someone, let's say, you know, like post CVA um, or like I personally like to use um, TENS. Like let's say you have someone, I can think of an example. A patient is, um, came in um, post hospital, uh, he had, bunch of fractured ribs. He had a lot of pain, a lot of pain stuff going on. Um, and you would not get out of bed. Like we just like could not get him out of bed. And so um, I used TENS as a pain control method in order to work on supine to sit so he could stand up so he could brush his teeth. So like you're using it as, uh, you know, as a adjunct to the occupation based intervention. Like the idea is not, I'm not just going to put on tens and let him sit there while I write a right. note for pain intervention, because like all of my goals, all of our goals should be occupation. Like they're all long-term goals should have an occupation attached to it. Um, and so like it's a, it's a means to get you to the next level. So let it be for, neuromuscular for that education method yeah. so that they can provide so that they can participate in the occupation based intervention. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I mean but, I you're not gonna have a goal just for using e stem or, or diathermy. I think I saw um the only time I saw diathermy was in North Carolina in a field work. But yeah, we we're in a small community based hospital so we mm-hmm. have very little in terms of mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's all about style and what people find purpose. I mean, you know, and the research to support some of the PAM or, you know, physical agent modalities isn't awesome. So it's like, why, why are we using it? Um, So it's just, you know, you're not just going to slap it on or use a diathermy and then just like let them do their thing. Yeah. Um, So I think that's what they're kind of saying. Like it needs to have a purpose, like not just putting it on because it's good for them (laughs) or whatever. We're healing something or whatever, whatever people can use. Again, tie it back into occupation. Always, always. Okay. Number four, don't use pulleys for individuals with a hemiplegic shoulder. Oh, man. So important. This was, I learned, (laughs) we're both so excited about this one. So (laughs) when I was in my... (laughs) My level two, my second level two is at an inpatient rehab hospital in Atlanta. And my CI told me, I think the first or second week she said, and I'll always remember this, whatever you do, if I see you using a pulley for a stroke patient, then you're going to fail. And I'm like, oh, I didn't even know about pulleys for stroke. But, and then I started looking into it like, wow, I guess that was a thing that people were doing. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was definitely a thing. Like some like old school, like old school therapists. I don't know if they were just taught, like honestly, and didn't know. But I remember like you'd have, I remember this therapist, you know, like they used to have, and maybe they still do, like those gloves, like you could put like a mitt that you could put on a patient so they could grab onto something. And they people would use them for like arm bikes and they put them on the pulley. So basically if you have a hemiplegic upper extremity, you could literally attach it to a pulley. Okay. And, um, yeah. And they would just like go to town on it, but like, you know, you really are not supposed to even, um, do active assistive range of motion to a hemiplegic shoulder over like 90 degrees. Like past 90. Right. Yeah. But I don't think, I think maybe that, I don't know if that's newer research or what that is, but like definitely old school, they didn't. And I just don't think they knew any better. I mean, you know, they talk about like with the whole pulley thing or, you know, no, nothing above 90, like people will say like, you know, cause they shouldn't even be doing, you know, active assistive, like, you know, hand clasping over, especially against you gravity. See those pictures, you see all those pictures of them pulling yes. it over the head and you're having X that out say, no, don't go over your shoulder. Don't do it. Don't do it. I mean, but they, I mean, there's lots of research supporting or, you know, saying that it actually damages that glenohumeral joint. And then, you know, you'll have those questions like, well, can you do it if they're in supine? Um, if you're assisting, but like, I think you have to have a certain level of experience to know that you're working, you're moving the shoulder blade, you're working on the scapula humeral rhythm, you're getting that. But it's not impinging. Yeah, it's not impinging. You have the humeral head in the correct position. And if you have a lot of experience, I think, you know, I guess, yes, but like in a gravity limited position, and, but like, there's no reason you just don't do it. And yeah, so, don't do the pulleys. I, the pulleys, I mean, people, I guess, love the pulleys, but I just, I kind of almost put the pulleys in with the rainbow art. I, I, you know, maybe, maybe not quite that bad, but it's you just, I don't know. I don't, I don't use them because I feel like there's other things that you can do. It's just too aggressive and patients don't do it correctly 90% of the time anyway. So like sending them home, but you do have those surgeons that say like, you know, for certain types of surgeries and that kind of thing, not talk about hemiplegic shoulders, but you know, there's a, Probably a time for and place other for other diagnoses, yeah. maybe, yeah. yeah, but not the hemiplegic shoulder. So I thought that was really interesting that they put it in this list because obviously it must be, it must be a thing that is still happening, being done a lot. Yeah. yeah, yeah, crazy, crazy stuff. Okay, and then the last one is don't provide cognitive based interventions. Example: paper and pencil tasks, tabletop tasks, cognitive training software without direct application to occupational performance. What do you think? I really like this one too because um, with brain injury and stroke, you can see in some rehab units just these like memory, like the guess who games and these games that just are not applicable to function still being used. And I get that there's maybe a place for working on attention, but I really do believe that if we're working on cognition, it should be functional. Yeah. Related to what the patient has to do when they go home. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you think about like, okay, what are we trying to adjust in general? Okay. There's lots of aspects of cognition, right? But if you're looking at, you know, um, oh, like anything from like, you're trying to figure out like attention to task, you're trying to figure out like flexibility and thinking, you're trying to think of, you know, like, what do they do when they're distracted? Like you're trying to think of, you know, like problem solving. I mean, all these different things, can also be addressed through, like you said, functional activity, shopping, uh, cooking, bill money paying, management. money management, medication management. I mean, like, why aren't we doing, why, why are we having them sit down with a pa- piece of paper and a pencil doing a task when there's so many things that we can be doing that's occupation based and purposeful to them? Is it that it's just hard? I mean, like, I don't, I don't, I don't really know. Is it like lack of training of like how to get there and I could see like I don't I, don't I could know. see I could see that because a lot of rehab yeah. facilities they yeah. may not have a lot of stuff but I was really excited that AOT this year they had several um, different short courses that addressed this and they had um, like powerpoints that you could download and with the different cognitive functional cognition tasks that you could use even with root planning to get to the gift shop and just so many different things at AOTA. So I was really excited. I want to say I saw like three or four cognition short courses even listed that address that functional cognition. So I think it's becoming more 
in the OT mainstream mm-hmm. now. Well, well, and you know, my favorite occupation based task of all time, coffee making. <laughs> I mean, how many things can you work on from a cognitive standpoint, just doing that? I mean, like you can turn that into like a two step directions to four step directions. I mean, if it's obviously purposeful to the patient, but like you can just take something really basic and turn that into a cognitive inter- cognitive based intervention. I mean, and it kind of goes along the same lines, I think of, you know, like that's why I'm a big fan of cognitive based functional assessments personally, because I feel like one, it's something that they're going to be participating in and you get so much information from that versus just a pen and paper uh, mocha and a mocha is supposed to be a screen anyway, but like give you something like the kettle test they're doing, they're participating in a task and you can, you know, figure out what kinds of cognitive issues they're having from that test or, if you've listened to my podcast, I'm a big fan, big fan of the CPT, the cognitive performance test. Like you just get so much information on their cognitive level doing functional activities. So I love those um, assessments that are functional. And for those assessments, if um, if an OT listening doesn't have those in their facility, can you easily access those? Well, some of them, the kettle test. Some of them, the kettle test. Have you used the kettle test? It's basically you're making. They're using a kettle, and so like you don't have to have a full kitchen. You have to have a certain type of kettle because you have to have one that plugs in, and there's a whole type of thing. And they have recommendations with the test, um, but it just has to go through it, and then it tells you talk, just talks about you know if they don't do this, then these are the types of deficits they ha- have. And these are things that you can work on. And the, I don't know, in the cognitive performance test, that's the thing about the cognitive performance test. It's based along um, Allen's um, levels. And so it lines up with doing Allen's levels without doing the Allen's, which I'm always kind of a fan of. <laughs> but it's very, 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 it's like $600 or something, honestly, ridiculous. But I will have to also say, I have every facility that when the OTs are like, we need to figure out some kind of functional performance test. And um, if that is one that we agree on, we can usually convince our facility to get it. Cause we're like, we're not addressing it like it should be anyway. So I don't know. Like, I think that you can kind of make a point. Some facilities yeah, can, don't care. Only a little bit like, Oh, well we don't have a budget. And, <laughs> but at least but, bringing it up and having the other OTs kind of advocate for that test. And the kettle test is free online. I found yeah. we can link that in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot, there's lots of them out there. I mean, it's just trying, I guess, being more aware of what are some of the functional cognitive tests are, but I mean, it really helps kind of shape and look at how can we make these cognitive interventions, occupation-based. Um, and they don't all have to be long or hard, or you don't have to have tons of equipment. It's just like using the patient's environment. As long as you have a plan of what they're having a difficulty with, you can take so many things and turn it into an intervention. So go on, OT practitioners. You can do it. <laughs> and a shout out to Glenn Gillen for starting this Choosing Wisely initiative and coming up with this article. I think this is really helpful that it's been sent out to every AOTA member to kind of see this and read these and think a little bit about, oh, is my, how are my interventions doing? Well, it's putting the patient in power. And I feel like that's so important. Like if, if, if a patient honestly would read this, I mean, I don't know how many do, but if they do, I mean, like, that kind of holds some people accountable that making sure that we are yeah. working at the top of our license. Cause that's what we should that's be doing. So, so absolutely. Anyway, this is, I love g- good one. AOTA love it. Join the choosing wisely campaign. We'll check it out and we'll put it in the show notes as well. So good topic, Sarah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. AOTA. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks everyone um, for listening. So until next time. Do you feel like you're navigating the OT world without a map? Not feeling confident or competent in your day-to-day treatments and struggling to apply your knowledge clinically? Then be sure to check out the Seniors Flourish Learning Lab membership. It has all the treatment ideas, patient handouts, clinical resources, community support, and mentorship you need to succeed. Join today at seniorsflourish.com slash learning lab.